Good morning, everybody. A uh, very warm welcome to the third day of this MSc lecture series that has been hosted by SSC, and we are very grateful that uh, Gokhale Institute has allowed us to host it in their premises. So, um, as you can see on the screen here, we will uh, sit through uh, Sir's delivery on uh, methodological issues of social science research, and I think that is extremely important and contextual given the kind of work that we do. So, without any more delay, let's begin today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, dear friends, colleagues and students, uh, well, this is the final lecture in this series of three lectures. And um, it is slightly different in spirit from the other two lectures that I have been giving. Okay. Uh, you see, for quite some time, uh, I have interested myself in issues of uh, research methodology in the social sciences, but of course in a, uh, with special reference to economics. And uh, in the course of a lifetime of uh, research on uh, econometric methods uh, applied uh, macroeconomic research and uh, dispensing some policy advice, I have encountered several kinds of, uh, several kinds of issues, okay, which need to be tackled on some kind of a systematic basis. You see, as a matter of fact, uh, the, my original plan of lectures was to give a sp special lecture on causality in um, economics and then also to speak about uh, chaos theory okay, because both of them are uh, topics of current interest. Uh, but then, uh, you know, the plan of the lectures was changed somewhat. N now, the, these issues, methodological issues, are uh, uh, sort of interdisciplinary in the sense that they involve perspectives from philosophy, mathematics, especially mathematical logic, statistics, and also the parent discipline. Okay? So from that point of view, these are uh, sort of interesting. Now, I deliberately use the word social science research because what I'm going to say is relevant not only for economics but for other allied branches of social sciences, okay? Uh, but uh, the exposition is purely non-technical, okay? I'll not introduce mathematical or statistical complications, okay? But I will refer to them as and when I go along, okay? <coughs> now the first issue which needs to be sorted out is the unity of science principle, okay? Is economics like physics, right? There is a school of thought which believes that all sciences are more or less alike in the sense that their subject matters might be different, okay? But they should be tackled by the same methodology. Okay. This is called the unity of science principle. I'll just explain it in a minute, okay? And uh, what are its implications for research, uh, for methodological research in economics, okay? So, this is called the unity of science principle and I'll just, just explain it in a minute, okay? Now, <coughs> this is, what is the purpose of any science? Whether it is physics, mathematics, or sociology or economics, it is understanding or explanation of observed events and phenomena, okay? So, you are, there are of course certain, certain sciences like mathematics, which are not so much dealing with observed phenomena, 
as dealing with uh, abstract objects okay but if you recollect your classical mathematics you will find that even classical mathematics was dealing with observed objects okay you see it is only modern mathematics which deals only with abstract objects okay but most sciences physics chemistry and of course economics history and so on are all dealing with uh, observed events or phenomena and based on this understanding to make predictions for the future in some sciences apart from forecasting the future there may be need to advise or suggest on policy matters okay so basically uh, one can say that first you try to understand the phenomenon then you try to make forecasts okay and sometimes you try to make predictions uh, i mean uh, you try to make uh, give policy advice okay the policy implications may not be possible in all sciences some sciences are purely concerned with observation like astronomy for example okay there is very little that you can do to control astronomical phenomena so you can't really give policy advice okay on um, you know uh, astronomical phenomena but you can forecast you can forecast okay when the world will end okay those kinds of forecasts you can try to have right so these are the three basic purposes of science okay now this it is very important to distinguish uh, between phenomena which occur regularly and phenomena which occur episodically right and i think that distinction is very important that distinction is very important okay so and the kinds of methods that we need for understanding one may not be applicable in understanding others okay so there are some phenomena which occur regularly okay like rains okay so why does it rain in mumbai okay in uh, the uh, say months like july okay why does it it rain in december but it rains in july normally okay so this is a regular occurrence it keeps on occurring every year so you have to look for an explanation right which explains this regular occurrence but then there are episodically occurring events like earthquakes tsunamis in the natural sphere or uh, socio political war war is not an everyday event but wars do happen right now if you are looking for explanations if you are looking for explanations of catastrophes right then the kinds of techniques that you are using to explain regular occurrences may not always apply that's why you see it sometimes becomes difficult to explain as we have seen yesterday for example it is very difficult to explain crisis in terms of standard theories okay because standard theories like you know neo classical and so on are designed to explain regularly functioning systems okay or what happens normally but what happens abnormally possibly you need separate theories of crisis okay so that is one important distinction okay now having given uh the types of phenomena let us also try to see types of explanations see no explanation see when different people try to analyze a phenomena okay i'm taking one phenomenon and then trying to see how many different kinds of explanations you can give okay now i'm taking a famous historical example as everyone knows the roman roman emperor julius caesar okay was assassinated by a group of senators okay led by um, uh, who is that uh, gentleman cassius cassius brutus and others okay they assassinated julius caesar on what is called as the eves of march which is a famous roman festival okay still celebrated in italy okay and which regularly occurs on 15th march so on 15th march 44 bc okay uh, so julius caesar was assassinated now suppose i pose the question why did julius caesar die okay why did julius caesar die there could be a host of explanations none of which is really wrong none of which is really wrong it it only shows that uh, you know um, 
the type of explanation which is given very often depends upon the perspective okay or on the need of the uh, investigator see one possible explanation could be along aristotelian lines okay purely philosophical you are a human being and all human beings die okay this i call as a tautological explanation because in a way it's explaining nothing in a way it's explaining nothing it's a tautology all of us why is it a tautology because it is true for all individuals okay why did julius caesar die why did napoleon die etc all of them will have this tautological answer so but that is one admissible explanation if you are fatalistic your reaction will be to say that poor chap it was his bad luck rotten luck okay that was why he died okay some people may be deeply theological and this is the kind of explanation that you often hear sometimes okay god punished him for his many cruel deeds in rome and in gaul okay this is a this is a satis uh, this is an explanation which gives satisfaction to some of us okay you know that the cruel and the merciless are punished okay so this i call as the explanation of divine justice apparently mrs julius caesar okay had a dream the previous night okay in which she dreamt that he is uh, he is likely to encounter some difficulties okay next day so she pleaded with him not to go but he did not listen to her and went anyway so his wife had told him not to go out that day because she had a bad dream but he did not listen to her okay so this i call as the superstitious explanation you see you see there, there are superstitions you didn't listen to your wife she had a bad dream yes and he went out okay and this is the explanation which is given by shakespeare okay if you look at shakespeare's julius caesar play okay you see that this is the explanation that he highlights he gives a great deal of importance to this aspect so that's another type of explanation okay now interestingly though many people don't know this an autopsy was performed on julius caesar okay body and the report is available in this book okay i located this book interestingly um and um, this book is uh, on forensic science and says that the first autopsy first medical autopsy was performed on julius caesar's body and look at the autopsy report it is so modern okay that's why i deliberately reproduced it okay what about it this is of course the english translation of the original uh, report written in uh, latin how does the report read there were 39 stab wounds on his body of these 16 were abrasions 5 were contusions 10 were lacerations and 8 were incised wounds of the latter wounds number 2 17 23 and 29 were deep and potentially lethal of this wound number 2 which was located in the fifth intercostal space etc etc had perforated the lower lobe of the left lung and cut the descending branch etc etc this wound number 2 is opined as the cause of death due to a hemorrhagic cardiac shock this is the medical autopsy report this is the medical explanation this is the medical explanation so if you are a doctor if you are a doctor okay looking for what why did caesar die okay you are not going to take any of the previous explanations this is the explanation which is going to satisfy you most you see we find it somewhat amusing we find it somewhat amusing you see because as social scientists we are not going to accept this explanation but what i want to say is that this is a perfectly valid and scientific explanation you see to a doctor to a doctor this is the explanation for julius caesar's death okay there are other kinds of explanations okay to a social scientists okay perhaps this explanation might be the most satisfactory of all the explanations that uh, you know have been given so far he was autocratic and wanted to assume total power in rome a certain group of politicians called the republicans did not like this and hence they got together to kill him okay this is the political explanation 
to most social scientists okay the last explanation would seem the most satisfying you see to most of us who are social scientists you see if the question is asked why did julius caesar die this is the kind of explanation that you would try to give now this is an explanation but social science is not concerned with explaining explaining individual phenomena okay we try to generalize okay that is what that is the difference between a social science theory and a case study you see you see the explanation given so far was a case study okay was a social science case study but we want to generalize okay and what is the kind of generalization that you would make from this case study you see in especially in management science but now increasingly in law and economics and several other cases you try to generalize from case studies you try to generalize from case studies so this is the kind of generalization which people would come to social scientists might come to politicians and military generals often become too ambitious and try to assert power by unscrupulous means they then come into conflict with people's will and this conflict finds expression in revolt often leading to fatal consequences often leading to fatal consequences so from this explanation you are trying to go to a generalization you are trying to go to a generalization that politicians and military gen generals sometimes become too ambitious and then they try to get all the power to themselves then they come into conflict and then you know often their uh, they meet with fatal consequences now once you generalize once you generalize you try to find other cases which fit this pattern okay now no case will exactly be replicated no case will be exactly replicated right uh, uh, but you see you can try to find similarities okay you'll try to find other similar instances and then in history you find this charles first of england more or less he made the same fate he was beheaded by oliver cromwell and his group louis 16th of france you see met the same fate during the french revolution tsar nicholas ii was killed by you know the revolutionaries uh, after the soviet revolution hitler okay was forced to commit suicide all of these become case studies which more or less fit the generalization above but with widely differing details with widely differing details now one thing i want to emphasize one thing i want to emphasize that these kinds of generalizations okay are not destroyed by exceptions they are not destroyed by exceptions you see you can find plenty of dictators plenty of dictators who were worse dictators than Julius Caesar but did not meet his fate you see for example stalin died of a stroke okay he was not assassinated or killed by a revolt okay general franco died in his bed okay even though possibly he was a worse fascist than hitler in several regards okay but these are these, these exceptions do not nullify the generalization okay because generalization is different from universalization okay we are just making that this is likely to hold in a vast majority of cases okay from generalization and case studies you try to build a theory okay so what would be the kind of theory that you would like to build from this generalization politicians cannot ignore people's will for long since people's will is best expressed in a democratic framework the ideal form of government is a democracy on a constitutional monarchy okay so see what has happened you have as a social scientist as a social scientist there is a particular historical fact that you have come across there is a particular historical fact that you have come across okay which you have tried to explain then this explanation you try to generalize okay you try to see whether this generalization explains other case studies okay based on if that is so if several case studies you can find to reinforce okay your generalization then you would try to develop it into some kind of a theory okay that's why it is generally now agreed now generally agreed though not universally once again i emphasize 
that the ideal form of government is a democracy. But there, of course, there are differences, whether the democracy is of the presidential variety or the cabinet variety and so on. That is a different matter. But still, most of us would agree that the ideal form of government is a democracy. Now, having given this background as to how theories are built up in social sciences, okay, and the precise role that generalizations and case studies play, okay, in, um, in um, developing social science theories, let us now come to this unity of science principle, unity of science principle and whether it is a good principle or, you know, a questionable principle. Now, it is attributed to the famous French philosopher, Auguste Comte, who wrote uh, an essay on positive philosophy in 1842, in which he initiated what he called as the law of three stages, called the law of three stages. Now, what is the law of three stages? Uh, he says that the human mind human knowledge and society as a whole develop through three successive stages, develop through three successive stages, theological, metaphysical and positive. These are the three stages that he uh, um, isolates. Now, how do these three stages operate? In the theological stage, all explanations, okay, all explanations. Now, what he is trying to say is every science, every science goes through the same three uh, stages, okay. So, in the theological stage, also there are three sub-stages. You have explanation by personified deities, okay, by personified gods. So, the first stage he calls as animism, okay or sometimes also called as fetishism, okay? Turning everyday objects and animals into items of extreme religious purpose, okay? Therefore, in almost all mythologies, you will have gods of thunder, you know, gods of rain, okay? Gods of fire and so on, okay? And people pray to them, people pray to them and the natural events, natural events, are ascribed to them. Those of you who have read Homer's Iliad or Odyssey would know that because the celebrated navigator Odysseus, Odysseus did not pray to the god of the sea, I think uh, Neptune, Neptune, Neptune god of sea, he did not offer prayers and sacrifices before he started on the journey, Neptune lost his temper and created a very big storm and then uh, you know Ulysses or Odysseus lost his way and so on. Okay. This is an example of animism and after you see and then uh, you know um, various kinds of animals are also endowed with particular properties evil or good. So this is one stage. Then polytheism, explanation of things through the use of several deities and then of course monotheism. So therefore, in this stage of science, all natural phenomena, including ec eclipses, okay, including eclipses, for example, was one natural phenomenon, was almost the first natural phenomena which can be used in order to illustrate the scientific. You see, if you look at the old records on eclipses, including the old Hindu records, for example, by Indian astronomers, you find that they forecast the eclipses fairly accurately, right? But eclipses are taken as manifestations, okay, of certain kinds of gods, okay, operating in order to punish mankind or something like that. The appearance of a comet in almost all cultures is regarded as an unlucky event, okay. You see, even in Shakespeare's plays, I remember, okay, uh, when in one of his historical plays, I remember when the particular comet appears, okay, um, the king is uh, killed in battle or something like that, okay. So, uh, and of course the famous, uh, uh, the famous historical fact that um, when one of the kings, I forget his name, was killed in battle, okay, a comet 
was supposed to have appeared the previous night. Okay. Anyway, and then of course, uh, you know, in monotheism, which is the last theological stage, okay, things are attributed to God's will. Okay, there is a supreme God, the supreme God. Okay, and you know you. Okay, the next stage becomes the metaphysical stage, where abstract forces. You see, you instead of saying God, okay, you say things like nature, fate, natural rights, instincts, etc. Replace supernatural forces. Replace supernatural forces. And one of the classic examples of this is Galileo's statement that nature abhors a vacuum. Okay, you see, when the Duke of Tuscany, when the Duke of Tuscany had this problem that he could not raise the water in his fountain above 34 feet. Okay, he asked Galileo, as the most famous scientist, to solve the problem, and he gave one simple answer: Nature abhors a vacuum. Nature hates a vacuum, which is the correct answer in a way. You see, but uh, you know, is uh, is would be called as a metaphysical stage because it's not a scientific answer. And then, of course, you see similar statements among the poets: "All of us are architects of fate, working in these walls of time." These are the kinds of explanations that we get, okay, at the metaphysical stage. The final stage is what is called as the positive stage. As the positive stage, a field of inquiry qualifies as science. When it attains the third stage, the third stage is concerned with the discovery of laws of coexistence, association, and conjunction. Okay, coexistence, association, and conjunction. Now, I should emphasize, you see, that even when a science, even when any science reaches this positive stage, the other two stages. Could still permeate the thinking. I'll, I'll I'll give an example. I'll give an example. Okay, you know that the famous uh, astronomer, come mathematician, Johannes Kepler, discovered the laws of planetary motion. Okay, you see, earlier it was believed that planets travelled in circles around the sun. He showed that planetary orbits are not circles, but planetary orbits. Are ellipses, are ellipses, and his scientific experiments and his scientific sort of calculations supported the idea that uh, planetary orbits are ellipses. But he did not publish his results for something like 10 or 15 years. Why? Because at that time, at that time, okay, even men of science believed. the folly and what was that you see the ancient greeks the ancient greeks believed that there were some nine beautiful curves nine beautiful curves the first beautiful curve was a circle first beautiful curve was a circle then it was a cycloid okay then the epicycloid then the catenary then the tetracycloid so nine the ellipse was not one of the beautiful curves Ellipse was not one of the beautiful curves. The thinking was, God is the supreme artist. God is the supreme artist. So everything that God has made must be beautiful. Therefore, okay, planetary orbits must fall within these one of these nine curves. Okay, so he tried to fit. He tried to fit all these nine curves, all these nine curves, each of these nine curves. You see, and in those days, without computers and with mechanical calculation, fitting each of these curves, okay, must have taken him at least six months of real hard work. Okay, he fitted each of these nine curves and found that they were not explaining the orbit. So he said something must be wrong either with the data or with my calculations. He did not publish his results for a long time. Okay, simply because of this superstition, of this superstition that his results will be laughed away. Because ellipse was not one of the beautiful curves. So even when a science, even when a science reaches this maturity or positive stage, it superstition and you know other kinds of theological factors could still dominate even at this stage. Okay. 
Now, uh, what about these three factors? Coexistence, association and conjunction. Phenomena coexist with each other. Lots of phenomena coexist with each other and sometimes they may be totally unrelated. Okay? Statisticians nowadays call this phenomena as spurious correlation. Call this spurious correlation. Okay? Association is established when coexistence is too frequent to be attributed to chance alone. See, uh, from coexistence to association is established when coexistence is too frequent to be attributed to chance alone and constant conjunction is established when the presence of one phenomenon almost always implies the other. You see, so only when you are able to step, go from coexistence to association to constant conjunction can you say that you have found some relationship between two phenomena. Okay? I give some examples of this. Some left-handed people can be extremely intelligent. Okay? Some left-handed people can be extremely intelligent and this is coexistence of genius and left-handedness. But I am sure there are plenty of people who are left-handed but not intelligent. So this could just be a chance association. This could just be a chance association. That's why there is, can be coexistence but it's not an association. A sufficient number of poor people are sick to establish an association between poverty and bad health. But not all poor people are sick. So constant conjunction is not present. Okay? So you can't really say that poverty is a cause of ill health. But you can say that there is a strong association between poverty and bad health. Constant conjunction is like virus and fever, fire and smoke and these kinds of associations. Okay? Now what is Comte's view of science? Okay? Unity of science principle was initiated by Comte and he said that all sciences, whether natural, social or historical, are methodologically similar, okay, are methodologically similar, but natural sciences are usually at a higher stage of evolution than social sciences, okay. So therefore, natural, which was the first, which was the first science, okay, to become positive in the sense of Comte, the first science to become positive in the sense of Comte was astronomy, okay. The second science to become positive in the sense of Comte was physics. The third science to become positive in the sense of Comte was chemistry, okay. He would say that, yes, today these are the sciences which have, which can be called as positive. In Comte's time, I think certainly these three sciences had reached the positive stage. But sciences, social sciences, like economics, history or sociology, have not yet reached that stage. But they will reach that stage if they continue to follow the methods and methodology of the natural sciences. Okay? Methods and methodology of natural sciences. And therefore, he says that all sciences should follow the same methods of enquiry. Follow the same methods of enquiry. And what are, what are the methods of enquiry which have succeeded? in physics, chemistry and uh, astronomy, the methods are mathematical, the methods are mathematical, okay. So therefore, economics, sociology and other social sciences can only succeed if they embrace mathematics in a big way, okay, and try to, try to reach the positive stage via the use of mathematics. So this is the reason. This is precisely the reason why mathematics has become the cornerstone, become the cornerstone of economic crisis today and has also become the cornerstone, you may not believe it, of political science research today. Okay? If you look, look up the American political, um, uh, you know, political review, political science review and so on, you will find that they are also using a lot of mathematics. Sociology has also become mathematical. Okay, under the influence of thinkers like Paul Lazarsfeld and so on. Okay. 
history is also on the way to becoming mathematical with this new science called cleometry where you know mathematical and statistical methods are used in order to explain this thing okay so this comes influence and the unity of science principle is very much at the heart of this tendency towards mathematization okay and quantification generally quantification of the social sciences of course most of us do it most of us do it instinctively most of us do it instinctively okay we are not i don't know how many people in this audience had heard of august comte before this lecture okay but all of you are learning mathematics all of you are learning statistics okay because of an implicit belief that unless you know this okay you cannot progress as economist now based on this okay there is the school of philosophy okay which uh, this is a german name for the school is called the erklaren school it's called as the erklaren school so what is the erklaren school this has got a firm belief in the unity of science principle the erklaren school has got a firm belief in the unity of science principle task of science is to understand phenomena by seeking to find instances of coexistence association and constant conjunction so therefore what is the erklaren school it is trying to tell you that look here as an economist you have to see if you want to discover laws in economics if you want to discover laws in economics you have to find instances of coexistence build up association and then examine constant conjunction while doing this while doing this you have to use your knowledge of mathematics and statistics so you have to use your knowledge of correlation analysis rank correlation and so on okay so this is the erklaren school so in the erklaren school you see according to erklaren school and in a sense the erklaren school today is the dominant school in social science research because you see this is how social science research proceeds you see we 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 do we do use empirical methods we do use empirical methods which are aimed at establishing this kind of constant conjunction and so on we do use theoretical methods which are strongly rooted in mathematics okay we use empirical methods which are strongly statistical you see those of you who read my book would perhaps remember that uh, i'm mentioning it here because uh, you know i may forget to mention it um, uh, later on is that i have tried to question the use of statistics in economics on one ground okay and that's an important ground entire basis of statistics the entire basis of statistics is ergodicity to which i referred yesterday okay you must be able to work out probability distribution of phenomena right and therefore to obtain probability distributions you need to conduct experiments right in experimental sciences in experimental sciences statistics can be used right statistics can be used statistics is essentially based on ex experimental sciences economics is not an experimental science it's a historical science it's a historical science there is no way in which you can conduct experiments of course experimental economics is slightly different okay so you can't conduct experiments in economics you can't conduct experiments in economics and therefore to that extent if you are using statistics in economics then you have to fundamentally okay make this assumption that economic reality is ergodic economic reality is ergodic which is the assumption which is the assumption that is made by the neo liberal view and the neo classical view that i talked about yesterday but does not figure in the keynesian view that is one of the reasons you see one of the empirical manifestations of the dominance of the erklaren school comes from the fact today that the new classical paradigm the new classical paradigm with heavy reliance on mathematics and econometrics okay has triumphed has virtually triumphed okay over keynesian thinking over keynesian thinking with its belief 
in totally unpredictable future. You see, if, there is, if the future is totally unpredictable, you can't apply nice looking probability distributions there. So therefore, it becomes difficult to understand. Okay? So this is the Erklaren school. But even within this, there are one, there is one school of thought who believe that science cannot go beyond constant conjunction. That is, constant conjunction is all that science can come to. This is David Hume, August Comte and so on. And those who believe that the aim of science is the discovery of causal law. And here Emmanuel Kant and J.S. Mill, etc. You see, that means, you see the difference between the two. One, one group believes, one group believes that the aim of economics is to establish causal laws. Money causes inflation, money causes output, okay? Another group believes that all that you can do is establish correlation or constant conjunction, you can't establish causation, okay? So you can, at the most you can say that poverty and crime are associated. You cannot say that poverty causes crime. You can say that exports, uh, exports are associated with high growth, but you cannot say that exports cause high growth, okay? So that is the basic difference between this school and that school, okay? Now, I'm giving Kant's views because they are quite important. In his famous book, Critic of Pure Reason, uh, he, I'm quoting from him, everything that happens presupposes something upon which it follows by rule, okay? So he says that causality, the principle of causality is a precondition for the very possibility of objective experience. Now Kant is difficult to understand, Kant is difficult to understand, right? And, um, but you see, essentially what he's trying to say is, all our objective ex experience and all our perceptions, all our perceptions are based on the principle of causality, are based on the principle of causality. The human mind is such, according to Kant, that every, for every thing, it wants to establish some kind of a causal chain, or some kind of a causal chain. I mean, you experience some pain some in some part of the body, your instinctive thing is what should have caused that pain? Is it something that you ate yesterday? Okay? Or is it some, uh, you know, uh, some other cause? Okay? So, the principle of causality becomes central to the very possibility of objective experience. Okay? There is a criticism of the Erklarin school and this viewpoint, certain, certain social scientists do subscribe to this viewpoint. The unity of science principle was methodologically challenged by a group of German philosophers, I mentioned their names, in the latter half of the 19th century. They argued for methodological autonomy of the social sciences in which phenomena were to be understood rather than explained in terms of prior causes. In such sciences, abstract concepts like meaning, language, intuition, and even rhetoric played an important role. Now, this group felt that sciences like economics, sociology, and history were on a different footing from sciences like physics, chemistry, etc. Okay? Because there, okay, the methods that you employ, the methods that you employ have to be quite different, have to be quite different. Okay? You cannot be a good economist, you cannot be a good economist by being a good econometrician or a good mathematician. Okay? And this group and as a, its modern followers, its modern followers say that there is a conflict between the unity of science principle and the unity of social sciences principle. Okay? The, the followers of this group in the current context have come out with what is called as the unity of social science principle. Okay? And they believe that the unity of science principle and the unity of social science principle are in conflict with each other. Now this group is saying that economists have far more to learn okay, from studying disciplines like sociology, history, political science, law, etc. rather than subjects like mathematics, physics or uh, you know statistics 
okay now they recognize that if you if you bring economics closer to these sciences then it will lose the sharpness of some of its conclusions and policy recommendations okay you see we will not be able to say that you know inflation in march 2013 will be at this particular level okay but according to this group we'll have a far better understanding okay of uh, economic phenomena this way and therefore this group emphasizes okay that in understanding say for example if you look at a typical book i mentioned um, uh, gorton's book yesterday on the current crisis okay he does not use any mathematics he does not use any mathematics to explain the current crisis you see contrast this with books like uh, carmen and reinhardt or others which have been written on the current crisis they'll be dealing with uh, you know uh, various mathematical models to predict the crisis gorton tries to take the history of crisis from the 18th century onwards and tries to see what are the common factors within this cycle and in a sense in a sense after reading gorton's book you get an understanding of the crisis which is totally different from the crisis uh, from the understanding of the crisis that you may get from reading a um, econometric paper okay so which understanding is richer and which understanding is more useful is a matter of judgment but i am saying you see that both points of view exist both points of view exist okay and that as young scientists as young scientists you have to keep an open mind you have to keep an open mind on these issues maybe when you grow up a little more okay when you become older you'll be able to make a choice you'll be able to make a choice uh, but i think this consideration is extremely important this consideration is extremely important okay therefore you see for example some of you might have read those books by charles bettelheim on the indian um, economic history and you know the history of planning and so on or the books by e h car on soviet planning and uh, you know the soviet union generally these are books which will enrich your understanding of phenomena okay or benjamin friedman's latest book on the moral consequences of economic growth okay that is a book which is written from this perspective there is a book which is written from this perspective it is not concerned with growth models it is not concerned with growth models or endogenous growth theory or something like that but it is based on this kind of historical uh, interactions so i think uh, in a sense in a sense the teaching of economics today is too much or very heavily loaded in favor of the air clearing school at the expense of what is called as the first thing school it's called as the first thing school another german term so this first thing element says that not that all phenomena cannot be reduced to mathematical terms cannot be reduced to mathematical terms and that there is always that something undefinable something undefinable which can only be understood okay let's say and i think a lot depends okay a, a lot depends on what is the type of phenomenon that you are trying to explain okay whether you plumb for the whether you plumb for the eclairin school or whether you plumb for the first thin school a lot will depend on the type of phenomenon that you are trying to explain now i i've given you three typical examples here why did the apple fall to the ground okay why did vesuvius erupt in lava explosion in ad 79 what caused world war 2 what caused world war 2 these are the three kinds of this thing so suppose you have to write an answer to each of this you have to write an answer to each of this okay the answer to the first question is in terms of a single cause okay this is what i call as a mono causal explanation you can just say that the apple fell to the ground because of gravity okay so there are several explanations which can be reduced to mono causal terms 
the answer to the second question okay as to why the uh, particular volcano exploded in AD 79 that is similar to the first question in a sense that it, it is a scientific question but there is not a single cause there is not a single cause but there could be a few basic causes okay if you take a seismological paper if you take you know papers in the journal of the royal seismological society you will find explanations of various natural phenomena like earthquakes tsunamis and so on they are explained in terms of a few basic causal factors for example in medicine today in medicine today you have a lot of research on what are the kinds of what is the relationship between styles of living okay and the incidence of certain diseases okay certain types of cancer say okay or in criminology you have a lot of sociological factors and how they influence criminal behavior the essential thing is a large part of criminal behavior can be explained in terms of about 10 to 12 important major factors and another other say dozen or so of minor factors okay the explanations are polycausal the explanations are polycausal but that is many causes but they can still be reduced they can be still be reduced to a certain set of identifiable factors okay so in both these cases i would suggest that an erklarian view that an erklarian view may succeed okay it may be difficult to explain the behavior of a particular criminal but it may be possible to explain the behavior of criminal types okay you may not be able to explain why mr a committed that particular murder okay but you can do try to say why certain types of murders are committed what are the common causes money property crimes of passion and so on okay so it is a third type of question okay what caused world war 2 okay now i know that many of us for various exams have to prepare these kinds of questions and then you will see causes listed okay in these guides and so on okay i think those are absolutely unsatisfactory that's absolutely unsatisfactory way if i were to told to write a book on what caused world war 2 i have asked the question what caused world war 2 my answer would be let me write a book on that because you see this kind of an answer okay this kind of a question cannot be answered in terms of a few basic factors you see it is you know and i have been reading excellent books on what see what caused the french revolution okay you see it cannot be reduced to a set of basic factors why maybe the french revolution Rousseau has a role to play in that. Voltaire has a role to play in that. Mirabeau has a role to play in that. Robespierre has a role to play in that. Okay. Louis XVI has a role to play in that. Marie Antoinette has a role to play in that. Okay. The Bastille has a role to play in that. Okay. What are the relative influences of these various roles? Okay. And so on. Has all. So therefore. if you cannot be, it, this cannot be reduced to a few basic causal factors and therefore such questions such questions are really the domain of the first in school cannot be analyzed in terms of the erklarian school okay now this is one issue this is one issue now uh, in this lecture it is not possible for me to give answers because as you will see uh, this is mainly a statement of issues this mainly a statement of issues and to make you aware of various schools of thought okay so one kind of methodological tension that you see in the social sciences i mean i am now summarizing the uh, discussion in the previous part one kind of methodological tension which you see 
in our social science is whether we should follow the Erklerian school and go in for more mathematical methods and more statistical methods and is that the way to approach economic reality or whether we should go in the direction of the first thing school try to establish greater unity with the social sciences okay other social sciences and try to understand economic phenomena that way these are the two major schools of thought these are the two major schools of thought okay and my own impression would be my own impression would be that as it happens in the united states as it happens in the united states there are certain schools of economics like for example the northwestern school or the chicago school which are totally devoted to the erklerian variety but there are other schools okay where the first thing variety of economic research is encouraged like the simon fraser university okay or uh, you know the university of massachusetts okay and others the amherst college and so on okay i think this is the right approach this is the right approach okay if it is possible to uh, it is difficult to standardize syllabus once we standardize the syllabus then everyone we are forcing into a particular group okay but i think it would be best if we get able to train okay people in both these kinds of schools depending on their inclination so that you know we have a pluralistic kind of educational system okay right now the next issue which i am going to take up is this entire role of determinism okay in uh, social sciences okay now the history of science uh, right up to the previous century was characterized by a firm belief in determinism not only in the natural sciences but also in the social and historical sciences now what is determinism determinism is that natural that phenomena phenomena are in a sense are in a sense predictable or would be perfectly predictable only if our knowledge was perfect okay you see so the basic underlying philosophy of determinism is that look here we can more or less forecast the state of the weather today okay with almost 99% accuracy especially in the states this is something that we could not do 50 years ago now we are able to do it why because our knowledge has improved okay similarly okay today we are not able to exactly forecast the course of business cycles in a capitalist economy but that is because our knowledge is imperfect okay knowledge is imperfect if we improve our knowledge and if we improve our understanding it may be possible okay to predict the exact regularity of the business cycle so determinism is the view determinism view that even social science laws social science laws occur or can be perfectly predicted or can be perfectly understood provided you see you improve your understanding okay provided you improve your understanding for example take uh, take marx marx says falling rate of profit rate of profit has to fall the rate of profit has to fall it is a law of nature it is deterministic it is deterministic you see and um, well there are no exceptions to this law okay and a similar belief characterizes so many um, so many of our economic uh, principles law of demand law of demand for money okay if you are getting a perverse demand for money if you get a you see suppose you do an empirical exercise demand for potatoes in pune city okay and you get an upward sloping demand curve okay and you show it to a professor you know something is wrong with your data something is wrong with your method something is there is a bug in your computer program okay you have not understood linear regression okay you have omitted some variable ultimately this is what i suspect happens ultimately the fellow fudges the result okay <laughs> right and comes to you comes to you okay with a downward sloping demand curve okay the correct scientific attitude instead would have been 
Okay. Okay. You have checked the computer program. Fine. You have checked the data. Fine. I will try to see why the demand curve is turning out to be upward sloping. Okay. This is what should be done ideally. This is what should be done ideally. Okay. But this is what happens. When you go older, you will find if you send the paper to a journal which has got a slightly perverse result, you end up with a perverse result. Okay. That in the old days, if you got a result that the demand for money was not stable, your paper would never be published. Your paper would never be published in a journal because they would always suspect that his data is wrong or his method is wrong or there is a bug in the computer program. Okay. So therefore, people, this determinism is very deeply entrenched in the thinking not only of natural scientists but also of physical scientists and therefore exceptions okay exceptions are not always treated with the respect that they deserve okay that's why uh, there is a program called shazam okay there is a program called shazam and i used to know the person who wrote that book uh, uh, the wrote that program the first sentence in that this thing is first quotation is every regression counts every regression counts okay and i think he's quite right there okay because our normal thing is that we run 400 regressions and then report the one which is the best one which is best best in what that is the only regression we supported the a priori thinking that i had okay but if i was really objective i should also consider the 399 regressions we did not support okay what i had in my okay i think we'll have a short break here and then you know we can this thing okay. okay um, you see so let me come to this aspect of determinism um, and um, you see there is this quotation from the famous uh, German poet Goethe which more or less describes the feeling okay, of the common man in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, Great eternal unchangeable laws prescribe the paths along which we all wander. Okay? So this is not only determinism, it is pre-determinism. Okay? You see that God has prescribed the paths along which we will all wander. Now, so, therefore, you see what, since it was believed, since it was believed that uh, laws, even in economics and social sciences, would be deterministic. And very often in practice, when people try to fit these laws, they did not get the expected thing. The science of regression, the science of regression develop. You know the typical regression model, what happens? We have an explanatory term. So y is equal to alpha plus beta x plus something else plus gamma z. And then you add an error term. You see, you add an error term. That error is supposed to explain measurement error, okay, our ignorance and so on. So the general feeling was the system is deterministic. The system is deterministic. But it does not conform to exact to the exact deterministic model because of partly or ignorance, measurement flaws and so on, disturbances, so on. Just for example, if you, if you really try to measure the gravitational constant by an experiment, unless you are doing it in a very sophisticated lab, you are not going to get g is equal to 32 feet per second per second. That is not g that you are going to get. You are going to get it as 31.9 or 32.01 or something like that. Okay? That is because even though g might be equal to 32, okay, there are measurement errors, there is friction, okay, you cannot ensure a complete vacuum in which to conduct the experiment and so on, okay. So this is the essence of determinism. 
So whether you talked about Newton's law of motion or Ricardo's law of rain or Marx's law of falling profit, they were all understood in the deterministic sense. It was of course realized that quite often the laws failed in their predictions. Such failures were attributed to chance or to the impossibility of human knowledge. I am reminded of this famous French writer Anatole France, okay, and what he had to say about chance. He said, the chance is God's signature, okay, when he doesn't want to sign, right? You see, so chance is something that God is ashamed of, okay, God does not like, he would not like to put a signature, so that is chance, okay? Uh, so that is more or less the view, okay, that everything is fine, everything is fine with this world, laws are deterministic, but you know, there is just that little bit of disturbance, okay, due to chance or impossibility of human knowledge. So a belief, what are the three principles of determinism? A belief that all phenomena and events of the world obey unchanging causal laws, okay, that you have causation running from phenomenon, one phenomenon to another, and all phenomena and events of the world follow this phenomenon. Certain things we don't understand, we may not understand at the moment, okay? Why? Because of the imperfectness of our knowledge. But there is also confidence in the possibility of discovering this law, at least in principle, at least in principle. Just as Newton discovered the law of motion, Kepler discovered the law of planetary motion, okay? Um, Einstein understood the mystery of the atom, okay, and so on. And unconditional belief in the method of formal logic, primarily mathematics, for understanding the external world, okay. See, they were quite open-minded on this, they were quite open-minded on this. You can have any method that you want in order to understand the external world, but the mathematical method is the most efficient, okay and also the most scientific. Okay? Therefore, with the principle of determinism, you also get a tremendous belief in the utility of mathematics. Okay? The utility of mathematics. Okay? And now, the challenges to determinism started emerging with the experimentalists. Okay? People who try to approach knowledge through experiments rather than through introspection, as uh, those, some of you might have read uh, Karl Popper's uh, words. Okay? There are several ways of getting knowledge. Two of the most important are experimental, other is introspection. You sit back in the comfort of your armchair and try to think how the world works. Okay? That is introspection. The other way is you get down to the field, conduct experiments, observe and see how the world works. Okay? In 1870, Mendel formulated the laws of heredity via an explicitly stochastic mechanism. Okay? Now, Mendel's laws are really quite complicated, but you know, in simple terms, you see, they are explained by the following example, that if a black man marries a white woman, Okay, then you are li and they have four children say, two of them, uh, sorry, one of them is going to be purely white, one of them is going to be purely black and two of them are going to have mixed shades of color, okay, that is Mendel's law, okay, that one in 25% of the population, the pure characteristic emerges and in 50% of the population, the mixed character emerges, that is Mendel's law in a very simplified form. What is less known is that Boltzmann gave a statistical interpretation to the theory of heat in physics, okay? And Paul Samuelson has got a paper on this called the Le Chatelier Principle, some of you might have read this in the collected papers. The development of quantum mechanics later gave a further fillet to the probabilistic viewpoint. You see the probabilistic viewpoint See, the difficulty that deterministic 
people, um, deterministic philosophers had in accepting the probabilistic thing was that Mendel could say that one child would be dark and one child would be fair and two would be mixed. But he could not say which child would be what. He could not say that the eldest would be fair or the eldest would be dark or eldest would be mixed. Okay? So that with all these probabilistic explanations, you can predict the average, but you can't predict the particular. Okay? You can't predict the particular, you can predict the average behavior, you can never predict the particular behavior. And that somehow, to the deterministic philosophers at that stage, somehow did not appear scientific. So somehow did not appear scientific. Because with determinism, you try to predict the outcome for each and every case, for each and every case. If one triangle is angle measure two right angles, any triangle you draw anywhere will also measure two right angles. Okay, so that is determinism. Okay. Possibly the concept of probability, okay, to describe social phenomena was first used by a philosopher called Quetlet in criminology. And here also I have gone into a little bit of history just for the sake of interest. For most of human history, deviant behavior has been attributed to possession by demons or spirits. It still is in various parts of uh, the world. Attempts to correct deviance were based on the belief that extreme punishment could exercise the possessed spirits. Even as superstition began to fade with the emergence of the age of reason in the 1700s, harsh punishments were often meted out to deviants and criminals. And, you know. So you see, the general philosophy was, okay, a one of deterrence towards criminals. And in part, that was because of the sway of deterministic philosophy. The early 1800s and early 1900s, the sway of positivism and the focus on the use of the scientific method had led to the emergence of new outlook on crime and explanations for crime. This new outlook was pioneered largely by sociologists. Okay? So Quetlet was the first person to try to see, try to understand criminal behavior via probabilistic modes. Okay? So he tried to say that there were several factors which went into the making of criminal behavior, some of which were of course intrinsic to him, but many other factors, okay, including environmental and sociological factors were there. So in a sense he was not totally responsible for his own behavior and that somehow had a moderating influence on the level of punishments. Okay. Now, as sciences began to grow, biological, psychological and social, new demands were made on probabilistic modes of explanations. Okay? The way statistical considerations featured in different systems could vary. You see, what happened was determinism became increasingly difficult to maintain as our methods of measurement improved. You see, and as our understanding of random phenomena, probability and statistics began to improve. You see, the first major book, the first major textbook on statistics Okay, which is usually attributed to Carl Pearson, okay, emerged somewhere around 1897 or something like that. Okay, by 1903, the famous German Biometrica came into existence, and in 1910, okay, the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society came into existence. Okay, and Statistics became an accepted discipline. Statistics became an accepted discipline by the first decade of this century, of I mean the previous century, of the 20th century. Okay. As statistics started emerging on the scene, see determinism slowly started giving way to probabilistic modes of explanation. Okay. Uh, but the way statistical considerations featured in different systems could vary. Some system would exhibit st statistical regularity so that the underlying probability distributions could be identified or at least reasonably approximated. Okay? You see, if the system is 
statistically regular and the statistically regular i mean that the probabilities don't change the probabilities don't change from context to context okay then you can try to deduce what those probabilistic distributions are and i have given examples like mendel's law or einstein's smolyakovsky theory of brownian motion etc such systems are called as ergodic such systems are called as ergodic or statistically regular statistically regular systems in biology and social sciences are not described by well defined and stable statistical distributions okay see for example even if you have identical twins born to the same set of parents growing up in the same environment you would still find that their medical history is not identical their medical history is not identical one twin may live to 90 years the other fellow might die uh, you know of something serious at an early age so therefore biological system as also social science systems okay may not work okay privatization of telecoms was a big success okay with the swiss telecom but was a failure with british telecom so therefore in social sciences also the same impulse may produce widely differing responses and therefore statements such as smoking increases the risk of heart attacks or exposure to screen violence leads to juvenile aggression are statistical statements but no definite probabilities can be assigned to their validity you see you cannot say that smoking increases do they try to do that nowadays smoking increases the probability of your death by 0.25% or whatever it is okay not due to or ignorance of the systems of faulty data but in an in, is an inherent feature of those systems attributable to multiplicity of influencing factors which cannot be averaged out by the law of large numbers uh, at least some of you must have heard of the law of large numbers okay with the law of large numbers you can average out certain behavior but people tend to forget that the law of large numbers is subject strongly to the what is called as the iid assumption identically and independently distributed okay if you don't have that assumption okay then very often statistical uncertainty cannot be averaged out so such systems are referred to as uncertain systems and in yesterday's lecture i referred to the fact that keynes view okay the investment environment as essentially uncertain in this sense okay you see when he economists sometimes call this as nightian uncertainty after frank knight after frank knight who distinguished between risk and uncertainty okay now i will quickly go through this formal theory of philosophical explanations partly because very few economists know about it and secondly also because it brings out certain problems that we tend to slow over in our empirical investigations okay hempel and oppenheim were two are two famous philosophers and they distinguish between two distinct models of inference what they call as the deductive nomological model for determining six system and the inductive statistical model for non deterministic system and then there is also a deductive statistical model and the inductive statistical model for uncertain systems okay this is a brief history now what is the deter how is how does the deterministic system look in a somewhat formal setup okay this is what hempel did this is what hempel did in a philosophical uh, this is a philosophical uh, kind of notation and event e has occurred the event e has to be explained in terms of a set of causal laws and a set of initial conditions in a set of antecedents or initial conditions the event e which is to be explained is called the explanandum the antecedent conditions and the causal laws are called the explanands okay in the deterministic system once you are given the initial conditions and the causal laws 
the phenomenon or the event follows as of logical necessity follows as of logical necessity okay and therefore the dn or the deductive nomological model is set up as initial conditions causal laws and explanations causal laws and explanation now for example take the law of projectiles you know when you throw a stone and it comes in a trajectory like this that is called as a projectile okay if from a particular spot if from a particular spot okay you throw a stone throw a stone okay with a particular force you are going to get a resultant trajectory okay you are going to get a resultant trajectory the initial conditions are the force with which it is uh, projected the height from which it is thrown okay and the position on the earth okay from which the projectile is thrown okay these are the initial conditions what are the causal laws the causal laws one of the causal laws is the gravitational constant because that particle starts moving now what happens is this is a perfectly perfect candidate for the deductive nomological model because whoever is the thrower whoever is the thrower as long as the force and the initial position is the same okay the projectile is going to land at the same place projectile is going to land at the same place it does not depend whether a is throwing it or b is throwing it as long as the same force is applied the fact that different people throw it to different distances is not because of the changing causal law but because of the different forces that each of them is able to generate okay so this is a deductive nomological explanation uh, you know this is more or less a parallel example of projectile now let us take the statistically regular system okay here you have the initial conditions you have the causal law but this is a statistically regular causal law okay so the probabilities are fixed the probabilities are fixed you now have the consequence you cannot say whether the cause whether the consequence will happen or not what you can say is the probability of what it will uh, the probability with which it will occur okay so therefore i put a line with a dot there to indicate that this deduction is in a probabilistic sense okay that means here uh, let me see if i give an example okay consider a family of four children born to a white mother and black father the event e could be that two children have brown complexion another one is black and the remaining child is white the antecedents could be the family history of the white mother and the black father where the probabilistic law would be mendel's law okay right so here you can assign probabilities to the outcome you cannot say whether the outcome will occur or not but you can say the uh, probability of the outcome okay in uncertain systems on the other hand okay you have the initial conditions you have the causal laws some of which are uncertain in the keynesian sense the double line indicates that the inference is inductive and r is the inductive probability now here uh, when i give these lectures to my students i have already taught them carnap and uh, jeffries and so on but here you don't have that background so i can just say that this is an inductive probability that is the probability which has been worked out from induction or keynes's rational degree of belief or jeffries sense now you say that c1 c2 c2 combined with l1 l2 ln will result in e provided r is sufficiently high r is sufficiently high now what that sufficiently high should be i'll come to in a minute okay now 
unlike deductive inference you see this is this is a problem you see most when you try to try to make deductions in a statistically irregular system look at the kind of problems that you get up and these are always almost always ignored in our research almost always ignored in our research let us see what are these problems unlike deductive inference inductive inference is not transitive inductive inference is not transitive suppose a arrow b is used to denote the fact that b follows deductively from a if a implies b if a arrows b or deductively causes b and b deductively causes c then together a will cause c together a will cause c okay deductively okay if a results in b and b results in c then whenever a happens c will happen so deterministic world this causation is very simple this causation is very simple okay but when you try induction if a causes b inductively if a leads to b inductively that is with a high probability r and b leads to c inductively a may not lead to c a may not lead to c see sometimes you know uh, i uh, taught econometrics for a long time in bombay university and also at iit india okay you see um, you have inquiring minds young and inquiring minds there okay so sometimes students would say that look here sir uh, what is happening is i am getting a sort of confusing result so what is that okay says so that uh, you see high pod money I, i think we talked about that term last lecture high pod money is causing m3 and m3 is causing inflation but high pod money is not causing inflation when i use the granger test when i use the granger test when i use the granger test i am finding that high pod money is causing uh, m3 granger causing and m3 is causing uh, inflation but high pod money should sure cause inflation you know is not causing inflation okay you see that is why i started giving these lectures i started giving these lectures because only when i gave this lecture this difficulty was resolved in the minds of the student okay that this is this can happen that nothing is wrong with this calculations nothing is wrong nor is anything wrong with granger causality nor is anything wrong with him nor with me okay you see all of us are fine all of us are fine okay this is a basic fact this is the basic fact of inductive inference this is a basic fact of, and i give a simple example okay suppose we say that if r on the previous slide is 0.95 which is high high enough 0.95 is high enough okay then in that case i will say that a inductively causes b that is a inductively causes b if b results from a with a 95% probability okay now suppose a inductively causes b with probability 9.5 and b inductively causes c with a probability of 0.97 then obviously a causes b and b causes c inductively but then the inductive probability associated with an inference from a to c is only 0.93 only 0.93 because it is a product of these two probabilities assuming that those two probabilities are independent the if you multiply 0.95 into 0.97 you should get something like 0.94 or 0.93 which is below which is below or acceptable level which is below or acceptable level which falls below or aggregate cut off thus precluding an inductive chain from a to c those of you who are sufficiently familiar with econometrics would have heard this term degree of freedom adjustment degree of freedom adjustment and that is precisely related to this this is precisely related to this and this is something 
which is rarely done in econometric research rarely done in econometric research okay see we test the hypothesis we reject it start taking another hypothesis we have to perform okay a degrees of freedom adjustment okay right you know in conducting the wall test for example we have to conduct a degrees of freedom adjustment the reason for this is precisely in this limitation of inductive inference if you want transitivity to hold if you want transitivity to hold then in that case r has to be adjusted r has to be the third r third r cannot be 0.95 okay if you want to maintain transitivity then the third r has to be the product of r1 and r2 okay third r has to be the product of r1 and r2 r3 is equal to r1 into r2 then only transitivity will be maintained okay so therefore you might be led to misleading conclusions you might be misled to misleading conclusions if you do not know that this kinds of adjustments have to be done this is one problem with inductive inference then there is an other problem with inductive inference okay is that in deductive inference let us see what happens in deductive inference if a causes b in a deductive system then adding c to a does not affect the deduction does not affect the deduction okay that is if a causes b then a and c also causes b for example a might be that all men are mortal b socrates is a mortal a implies b a implies b now you add and deductively a implies b deductively now if you also add another statement c that all men are selfish okay all men are selfish then even if you add c to a a and c is still implied b socrates will still die okay the addition that all men are selfish all men are selfish okay does not change the basic conclusion the situation changes drastically with induction okay the statement a refers to the fact that mr x leads a very regular and clean life and b to the prediction that mr x will live up to a ripe old age then from a you can reasonably reasonably infer b okay a is that this fellow is taking exercise regularly etc etc and he eating good food he is likely to survive up to 85 okay a but this is an inductive statement okay there is a high probability that mr so and so will survive up to 85 however if you have the additional knowledge that mr x parents died early of some hereditary disease then a and c together will affect the probability a and c together will affect the probability okay that is when the doctor that's why it is important to share all the information about your history with the doctor when you go to the doctor he will ask you okay this that etc because the more information he has okay he is liable to change the inductive probability the liable to change the inductive probability so therefore okay you may get situations like two factors together one factor causing another granger causing but when you have two factors together together they may not cause this thing okay which seems a bit surprising which seems a bit surprising okay so therefore inductive inference is full of pitfalls okay there are other problems the requirement of a high value for the inductive probability r is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for valid inference you see what should be the value of r we have said that it has to be high now some philosophers have criticized this notion of it being high it's neither necessary a cure for the common cold is announced which involves one week's treatment okay suppose i announce that i have got a cure for the common cold only thing it will take one week's treatment then people adopting this treatment would report high rates of recovery but this could well be because most colds 
last anyway for one week okay thus a high value of r is not sufficient for a correct inductive inference okay secondly arthritis usually strikes the elderly hence it is perfectly legitimate to talk of old age as the cause of arthritis okay right you go to the doctor and you say that look here sir my knee is paining my left shoulder is paining okay you say you are becoming old man okay see so old age is a legitimate cause of arthritis even though the proportion of old people actually getting the disease is fairly small okay if you take the sample of old people the number of people who suffer from arthritis is not as much as you think okay certainly not 95% which you would regard as a high probability thus a high value of r is also not necessary for inductive inference therefore inductive inference is very delicate ground and there are other models of inference etc which have been suggested but i think we will not go into this okay so therefore this is an other problem area in economics this is another problem area in economic inference that is our inference is inductive our inference is inductive and therefore it is subject to several limitations one limitation which is very important i i talk about the two basic limitation one limitation which is very important is this about adjustment to the degree of freedom okay in making these kinds of transitive statements that is one thing the other thing is that be sure be sure that you don't have an omitted variables problem be sure that you don't have omitted variables problem try to see that all the variables have been accounted for and this becomes a problem for the serious econometrician do you suppose you want to test the hypothesis x proves cause uh, say gdp to grow exports cause high gdp growth if you just make a bivariate granger causality test you may get some conclusion yes that export causes but if you correct for all the other factors which are likely to affect gdp okay you may find that exports don't cause gdp after all okay so therefore it is very very important to take into account all the factors which are saying but but the more factors you take the less are the degrees of freedom that you get okay economists rarely get more than 40 or 50 observations especially if they are working with annual data so at the most with 50 observations at the most you can really take four or five explanatory variables if you take all the explanatory variables they may come to about 15 or 16 you are sacrificing a lot of valuable degrees of freedom okay so that is the eternal dilemma of the econometrician okay so that is one area which is a problem now i come to this third area which is causality in economics okay now this is an area which once again um, you know has attracted a great deal of attention the entire topic of causality is very interesting you see i had the good fortune in when i was very young to meet the famous physicist sudarshan okay uh, when i was at austin texas okay and he was a delightful man and he had written a small monograph on causality in physics okay which he gave me as a present and um, i read that and that stimulated my interest in this entire concept of causality i did not know that the causality in physics had undergone so many uh, distinct changes so many distinct changes okay at one time the influence of kant on physics was very strong okay so all physical laws were not considered scientific unless they satisfied the causality principle okay for some reasons which he refused to elaborate button russell was very much against the idea of causality was very much against the idea of causality in the natural sciences and in his principia mathematica those of you have had the patience to read that 1400 pages volume okay you see i think is the most unreadable book 
that I claim to have read. Okay, <laughs> so it is it is a the jokes apart. Okay, if if you see that book, okay, somewhere there it is mentioned in one of those one thousand four hundred that the word causality should be banned from the scientific lexicon. Okay, now this this kind of thinking got reinforced after the quantum mechanics revolution the quantum mechanics revolution of schrodinger and um, you know uh, heisenberg and others okay brought out that the uncertainty principle of heisenberg you see in quantum physics really put a big question mark on the notion of causality in economics but in the famous einstein podolsky rosen experiment to which i was referring during tea time to some of the students okay in the so called epr experiment which is einstein podolsky and rosen okay which uh, is uh, published as a three piece uh, three page piece you see in the american physicist okay of 1936 or 1937 okay einstein podolsky rosen okay challenged the quantum mechanic uh, sort of this thing okay especially the copenhagen interpretation and uh, therefore once again causality which was first on a high pedestal later on challenged by the quantum mechanics revolution once again re established after the epr experiment and so on you see so therefore the concept of causality in physics has undergone a lot of lot of uh, sort of vicissitudes okay coming to causality in economics okay and generally social sciences what is the obvious definition of causality you see if you're talking if you ask a common man what is an obvious definition of causality he would say that c is the cause of e if it is both necessary and sufficient okay this is one kind of definition that seems intuitively very appealing c is the cause of e if c is both necessary for e and c is sufficient for e on some reflection however most phenomena can result from multiple alternative causes okay and therefore the above definition is devoid of its operational significance at least the necessity part okay you see many phenomena many phenomena you see inflation for example inflation suppose you want to uh, you know suppose you want to test the monetarist proposition that money causes inflation money growth causes inflation okay now if you impose if you interpret the word cause in the sense of necessity and sufficient what will happen money can cause inflation you know the sufficiency part of it is satisfied but there are so many other things which can cause inflation okay even if you maintain the money growth at a very reasonable level at a modest level if oil prices rise you see or if there is a drought or if there is a strike or if there is a war okay inflation could still rise okay so the necessary part of it okay necessary part of it will not hold necessary part of it is not hold okay because most phenomena occurring in social sciences are multi causal in the sense that they are caused by various alternative factors okay and therefore john stuart mill john stuart mill who was one of the in my opinion one of the leading geniuses of his time okay has defined a cause as comprising three elements okay sufficiency see he excludes necessity if c happens then so does e so sufficiency is there c precedes e in time c occurs before e in time okay because the cause has to occur before the event okay cause has to occur, occur before, uh, you know otherwise you cannot say that it has caused the event okay the same cause always has the same effect same cause always has the same effect this is called as uniformity of nature uniformity of nature okay many people have said for example einstein has said that god does not play dice with the world okay gathe just now said that unchanging laws the word unchanging is quite important okay 
laws of god do not change laws of nature do not change okay now what are the drawbacks of mills definition okay a carelessly thrown cigarette can start a forest fire but only if there is a strong wind blowing in a particular direction okay you see you throw a cigarette carelessly okay in the forest 99% of the time it won't start the fire okay but if the wind is blowing in a particular direction and if uh, the forest is dried up to a particular degree it can well start a fire but yet legitimately legitimately you in the police records you would say that the fire was caused by the cigarette okay the cigarette is not a sufficient cause okay the presence of other factors makes it a sufficient cause okay right it's not a sufficient cause of itself it become sufficient in the presence of other conditioning factors smoking itself may not cause a heart attack but smoking combined with poor environmental conditions you see too much sedentary habits okay hereditary uh, factors etc might cause heart attacks or cancer uniformity it is considerable that causal patterns may change within a very short period i have personally had this experience personally had this experience i have uh, you know as uh, you know as somebody who has had a cardiac problem okay i have been on a particular drug for a very long time okay for something like 15 years i have been taking a particular drug suddenly one day i found okay that it was producing uh, you know a lot of allergic reaction so i went to the doctor and he asked me what is this uh, what are the drugs you are taking this this is the drug that you are taking oh that must have caused the allergy i told the doctor i have been taking it for the last 15 years he said that this drug can cause an allergy all of a sudden okay so that the uniformity in nature a drug may reduce the pain of a headache at one time but not another one even though the other external conditions have not changed okay so even though you are on the same medication for years together suddenly one day it may produce some adverse reaction so uniformity of nature is also not a very sound principle temporal precedence okay expectations or fear of future events can trigger current behavior okay the nazi persecution of jews nazi actual nazi persecution of jews did not start till 1936 okay but the nazi exodus from nazi germany okay that sorry the jewish exodus from nazi germany started way before 36 okay in some cases even people like einstein for example einstein migrated to the united states somewhere in 1930 or 31 okay so well before the event well before the event still you will say that it was nazi persecution which was the cause of the jewish exodus okay <coughs> now two notions of causality seem to be dominant in the literature those of you who read books like hicks's causality in economics okay or lionel robbins's three essays on the state of economic science and then you read Granger's Econometrica 1969 paper. Okay, both of them are do using the word causality, but they are using the word causality in totally different senses. Okay, the first chap, first group of people, are using causality as an algebraic property of representations, as an algebraic property of representations. Okay, the second group is using causality as an empirical or real world. relation that is granger and company okay and this is hicks and company okay nowadays okay most of us when we talk of causality are really referring to empirical causality and not to causality in the algebraic sense this is important to remember uh now before we come to granger causality i have several other methods okay which uh, we will we'll not discuss in detail we'll just slur through them 
there are model based methods of causal analysis and database methods that we already discuss in the model based methods we have simons causal chain approach okay simons causal chain approach uh, sorry simons causal ordering approach strots and walls causal chain approach and then the informational approach of leroy and i should add kolmogorov here i should add kolmogorov here okay in the last okay so these are three views which are based on models which are based on models that means causality is postulated in the model itself causality is postulated in the model itself database methods the two most prominent are the weiner granger causality and the graph theoretic method now uh, most of us are familiar with the granger weiner granger causality and the graph theoretic method i was proposing to give in my earlier version when i was going to speak on causality theory i was going to talk on the graph theoretic method but then you know uh, that will be sort of somewhat mathematical okay i am not going to cover this for lack of time okay uh, i just this is quite difficult but i just leave this slide on okay keynes also had some contribution to causa causality he called said causa cognoscendi like all intellectuals keynes was very fond of using latin terms okay but that is not what i want to talk about i want to talk about the fact that in a sense keynes was a brilliant combination of many different things okay you see and there are at least four aspects to him at least four aspects to him we know him as a brilliant theoretician brilliant economic theoretician okay from general theory treatise on money and so on okay that is one aspect second aspect which people may not know much okay there is a very strong practical side to him okay did you know that he was he wrote a very brilliant essay okay on the treaty of versailles okay because he had accompanied Uh, i think uh, lloyd george okay lloyd george the british prime minister when the treaty of versailles negotiation was going on it took place in a, um, a railway carriage okay it took place in a railway carriage and the french side was represented by clement so and so on okay kings participated actively in the discussion okay and um, he wrote a very perceptive piece on the treaty of versailles where he had anticipated we had anticipated that germany is going to rebel germany is going to rebel because of the unfavorable terms that were imposed that the allies have imposed on this so therefore he was a very shrewd practical man okay the aspect that is equally unknown about him okay was that he was a brilliant mathematician okay he was a brilliant mathematician and he wrote a book which is called as a treatise on probability or the treatise on probability which uh, is uh, a very difficult book a very difficult book where this concept of causality is discussed okay as a matter of fact treatise on probability was written fairly early in his life now some of you must have heard of the mathematician emil borel okay emil borel and uh, in my book on econometrics uh, there are these borel sets and borel majority and all that so that is the emil borel we are talking about Emil Borel wrote a very very favorable review of Keynes's treatise on probability okay uh, but that the review somehow I'm not getting hold of I read that review but I can't remember the exact reference now uh, and then he makes this comment that I wish instead of dabbling in economics Keynes had stuck to mathematics okay his contributions would have been far more enlightening okay and this is something somewhere in 1924 or so okay so king for the brilliant mathematician too okay. i am not discussing this details okay now weiner granger causality i'll spend a couple of minutes on okay this is a concept of causality most familiar to econometricians and um, all of us have used this concept at some time or the other in our lives okay there are two basic ingredients to this concept first is causality is being interpreted 
in one of its weakest senses as predictability you see predictability is different technically from causality okay because if a is able to predict b reasonably well can we say that a is a cause of b right if a can predict b reasonably well can we say that a is a cause of b okay secondly but this is the definition this is the base of the definition secondly it assumes less controversially that cause precedes effect in time cause precedes effect in time using these two concepts using these two concepts uh, granger defines x as a cause of y x as a cause of y if a very simply put x is a cause of y if we can make better predictions of y by using the information contained in x by using the information contained in x suppose you want to make a prediction of inflation you want to make a prediction of inflation if you look at all the past data on inflation if you look at all the past data on inflation and you try to make a prediction via an arma model via an arma model you will get certain predictions okay now suppose you know, record those predictions now instead of predicting it purely on the past of y you also use say money supply also use money supply so you use both past values of y as well as x say which is money supply and you find that you are able to make better predictions in a statistically significant better in a statistically significant sense then you can say that x causes y x causes y but really what you are saying is with x you can make better predictions of y right so what is dangerous what is dangerous is that granger causality is often used as the basis for policy okay you are only say for example when you get exports granger causing gdp uh, exports granger causing gdp 99.5% of the people who have uncovered this relationship will therefore advocate that in order to promote growth you should encourage exports strictly speaking it's not true strictly speaking it's not true okay exports are not causing gdp in that sense okay exports are only enabling you to predict gdp in a better way okay so therefore in a way granger causality is being used in a rather unimaginative way okay once again predictability is understood in the sense of minimum square only linear forecasts are concerned uh, you see i experimented with a lot of non linear models okay mainly because of my interest in the statistical aspects of non linear models and i found that there was this basic problem that x may not linearly granger cause y but may cause it non linearly okay if you include non linearity is you know say therefore for example uh, in one of my papers i said that foreign exchange markets okay foreign exchange markets are not efficient why because if you use past information in a non linear manner okay you can make better predicts uh, you can make better uh, predictions okay so therefore okay market prices are not reflecting all the necessary information okay only when you use it linearly only when you use it linearly are you getting this non predictability result okay there are problems one has to distinguish between causality and exogenity causality and co integration causality and policy instruments now each of this is a theme of itself and is not developed here now this last topic i'm not discussing because of lack of time and i'm very keen to have some time for questions okay some time for questions so once again i have to request i will jyoti or uh, rajas or somebody to just come here and help me tackle the questions okay hello 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 can you start uh, 
Sir, my question in context of Indian economy. That's uh, why not Indian economy of practice the capital account full convert convertibility. Can That's it. Uh, yes. Hello? Sir, not audible. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sir, my question is uh, in context of Indian economy. That's uh, why not uh, Indian economy follow the full capital account convertibility rather uh, than partially follow the partial capital account convertibility. No, we are not able to hear your question clearly. Okay. So can you just break it up simply? Sir, my question is that why not Indian economy follow the whole capital account convertibility? Other than it follows the partial capital account convertibility. Convertibility. Partial capital account convertibility. Partial capital account convertibility. Capital account convertibility. Yeah, sorry? What, what, uh, Can you repeat it? Shantanu, we can't get it. And the entire issue really boils down to two or three things, okay? How far is foreign capital productive, you know, from a domestic point of view? What are the problems created by the flow of capital, okay? And have we taken sufficient number of safeguards, okay, to prevent the adverse consequences. Okay. Now capital, if you, had attend, if you have attended my first lecture, uh, I pointed out there that capital account convertibility does make the task of monetary policy quite difficult. But that is not the main reason against capital account convertibility. Okay. Uh, we have had the Tarapur 1 and Tarapur 2 and even this uh, Percy Mystery report and Raghuram Rajan committee report all refer to movements towards capital account convertibility. One problem there is that capital account convertibility increases your vulnerability to financial crisis. Okay? One of the reasons for example that the Asian crisis did not affect India, though it was strongly expected to affect India, was that we did not have much capital account convertibility, okay? It was partial, I would even say it was just a little bit of partial account convertibility at that time. You see, that was the reason why we were saved. I think we were also saved from the global crisis, partly because, partly because our capital account con was not fully convertible, okay? While most of us recognize that foreign direct investment is beneficial, okay, what are the sectors into which foreign direct investment is flowing in India today? You will find that most of the foreign direct investment is not flowing into infrastructure or electricity generation and those kinds of sectors or even manufacturing, but most of FDI is coming, you know, in the services sector. Services. In the services sector. Right. Now, there have been lots of empirical studies, lots of empirical studies, whether foreign direct investment is conferring enough benefits. Now, we don't have enough econometric evidence to really conclude either way, okay. But if at all foreign direct investment has benefited um, Indian economy, it is only in one sense that it has introduced a measure of competition and discipline okay, in the Indian sector. But having said that, having said that, okay, if you look at the Indian balance of payments, the payments on account of things like royalty, okay, and dividend repatriation and so on has been increasing at an alarming rate, okay. One of the reasons why our current account has deteriorated in the recent past, okay, is because of these kinds of payments, the net payment, because you know we are getting net inflows on the payments account and the net outflows. The net payments, the net payments are still, are still substantial, are still substantial, but slowly, if you look at the items carefully, you will find that unless the net payments keep on growing at a particular rate, these net outflows, okay, are also are going to weigh down on us at some date in the future, 
okay that is one point secondly it leads right now our problem is that the rupee are depreciated but you know in the normal scenario in the normal scenario scenario very often you get an overvaluation overvaluation of the rupee okay and at that time people would say for example that if your rupee is strong if your currency is strong because of a current account surplus then the economy is building muscle okay if your currency is strong because of capital flows capital inflows then you are putting on fat okay then you are putting on fat okay there is a difference between the two there is obviously okay right so therefore capital account convertibility and besides nobody is entirely sure what are the exact benefits to the economy of foreign uh, portfolio investments foreign portfolio investment the issue of participatory notes issue of participatory notes on which researchers have been drawing a lot of attention including myself you know in articles i do i have written about three or four articles on capital account convertibility okay all of which have fallen on deaf ears okay apparently nobody reads my articles okay um which only prompts me to write more articles <laughs> right anyway but you see the point is that uh, participatory notes okay are one form of money laundering which is going on in an extensive way okay and okay and this is a more controversial statement and which i am not i am not making an original statement here i am just quoting from a speech which was made by uh, the former advisor uh, security advisor uh, mr narayan mr narayan or the former security advisor okay uh, he had said that a lot of terrorist funding a lot of terrorist funding okay is coming via because of the capital account convertibility and not only for india but for several other countries including pakistan this was a problem okay so therefore capital account convertibility the benefits are there benefits are there provided you are able to attract fdi in the right sectors okay right so therefore i will say that there is a case for selectively keeping the capital account open okay but to keep it open in a blanket sense okay and it is always better okay it is always better to be a bit cautious on that and to say that or to reserve to yourself the right to impose capital controls at least on outflows whenever this becomes necessary for example brazil has followed a very wise policy on this you see now they actually tax inflows into brazil okay i think this was a 90 2009 or 10 development okay right so i think that is a limited answer to that okay all right but of course if you read my article there is a full case against capital account convertibility okay sir so my question is uh, how the quantity using uh, as a tool of monetary policy helps the helps the uk us and the euro country during the financial crisis period quantitative easing due to monetary policy mm -hmm. Continuing easing due to monetary policy. Yeah. Go uh, ahead. What What are you wanting to know out of that? So, how the quantitative easing uh, as a tool of monetary policy helps the UK, US, and uh, Europe in the financial crisis period? Okay. How did quantitative easing help? Hmm. Yeah, I think this answer I already gave yesterday, but I I I don't mind repeating it. Okay. You see, quantitative easing. You see, when when the economy is facing that kind of a recession, okay. from the that country's point of view from that country's point of view quantitative easing is the only alternative okay because the rate of interest is near zero okay rate of interest is near zero and you are almost at the liquidity trap almost at the liquidity trap okay so further lowering the rate of interest is not going to help so the only way that you can have is to have quantitative easing that whether that is succeeding or not we don't know okay it is certainly succeeding to some extent in the us okay but not to a very large extent in europe okay quantitative easing cannot be a substitute for other policies on the real side of the economy okay right but and there are a lot of them including fiscal consolidation this that etc okay but uh, 
my argument was that quantity easing is creating problems for countries in Asia and so on, or is likely to create problems. And the other major problem from their point of view was that quantity easing is going into the stock market and real estate rather than going into the manufacturing sector, rather than going into the manufacturing sector. So, and this is what the US should be doing, but it is very reluctant to do, is to have some kind of selective controls, okay, to see that the increased liquidity does flow, okay, into the sectors which are necessary to pull the economy out of recession, okay. Stock market booms and asset price booms don't pull the economy out of recession, okay. Ultimately, if they restore confidence in the investor, okay, and he may invest, that is different. But no stock market uh, uh, liquidity fuel booms in the stock market are usually and rightly seen, okay, by investors as bubbles, okay. Once again, there is a difference between stock market prices which are feared by real factors and fundamentals and those which are feared uh, uh, yeah, just by sentiments based on enhanced liquidity, okay. So that one has to make a distinction between that, okay. Yes. Hello. Hello. Just, ah. just one minute. Yeah. Come. Can you speak loud? Yeah. yeah the, the mic has reached you. difficult is it to operate a mic, my dear? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody might have a loud voice, so you can. Do we have any dynamic model that take care of economic changes given that the models initially used become obsolete in the sense that the expectations get aligned whenever previously applied model is used to rectify current economic problems setting ground for the uh, paradigm? Uh, hmm. Any models which can be scientifically used? Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, that is, is a good question in this sense that, uh, you see, uh, what happens is most uh, policy making, most policy making bodies have their own models, okay, have their own models. Uh, for example, the Reserve Bank of India also has some model to forecast the liquidity and so on and from which to base policy, you see. Uh, the Planning Commission apparently also has a model, okay, which is sometimes comes out in the technical appendix to the plans and so on. Now, yeah, draft plans. Now, well, you see, the models have an inbuilt correction mechanism, you see. The main thing is that when the models are being used for policy, the parameters, okay, might evolve over time parameters might evolve over time and therefore what is usually done in most models of this kind is that parameters are changed gradually de depending upon the observed errors of the model, okay. Suppose you have a model, a very simple model to forecast inflation say, okay, composed of some three or four equations. If you find that it is consistently under predicting 
okay inflation or consistently over predicting inflation then what you do is you try to temper or uh, tamper around with the parameters because you feel that the parameters have changed and therefore you will change the parameters will change the parameters and this is what is called as adaptive you know adaptive change ad adaptive parametric changes okay adaptive parametric changes okay or sometimes to give it a technical term this is called as adaptive filtering called as adaptive filtering okay so this is one correction mechanism that is incorporated now this what is the philosophy behind this change the philosophy behind this change is that the basic structure the basic structure has remained the same in terms of this hempel kind of models the causal laws have remained the same it is the antecedents which have changed okay that's why you just change the parameters you just change the parameters or better still okay some people not in india but you know in for example in the bank of england have a variable parameter model that is the model is allowed to be dynamic model is allowed to be dynamic in the parameters also so this can be done but if the model consistently fails consistently fails okay then obviously it would mean that the structure of the model has changed and that means one of the causal laws okay has changed then you have to reestimate the model you have to reestimate the model which is a separate exercise so therefore most models have a lifetime of about 3 to 5 years now okay before they are completely overhauled before they are completely overhauled it has been found that optimally that is about the life of a model the duration of a model that is during this 3 or 5 years the model can still make fairly good assessments based on parametric changes using adaptive filtering algorithms later on you see they will have to be scrapped and new models built up so that possibly answers yeah, yeah. Uh, no, hello yeah i have a question uh, relating to the quantitative easing question that was just asked earlier uh, if i may take the example of japan uh, in the uh, 80s. 90s uh, 90s uh, in the 90s japan went through 10 quantitative easing programs and uh, basically it just was enough to keep the economy buoyant uh, one of the things that i have researched uh, in the japanese uh, uh, decade of the 90s is that the japanese uh, individuals had savings uh, the country didn't have the economy didn't have any savings and obviously there was a channel through which uh the quantitative easing allowed the savings to be channelized to the government mm. and hence the economy has been kept buoyant over there uh if i were to take a, a kind of a you know relationship there with the us economy uh the quantitative easing programs that are now emanating in the us uh, we already have officially been announced qe1 qe2 maybe qe3 is around the corner uh there's a specific uh field of thought which is the austrian school of business now the austrian school of business suggests that actually you should let the economy reset itself you must let it collapse once only then this entire process will be undone uh can you give a little view on that because there are a lot of believers in the austrian school of thought and uh, uh if if it's not so if that is not true then what we're really saying is that the quantitative easing programs will have to keep continuing the us is heading towards a debt trap it may have the dollar may be the reserve currency of the world but then where are we headed see either we take the austrian school of thought or we don't so Can you just give a view on that? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, you see, the Austrian school of thought does do does explain certain features, okay, of the cycle which are not explained by purely monetary explanations and so on of the cycle, or the financial accelerator kind of uh, explanations of the cycle. But you see, this process of creative destruction. okay that the austrian stock about okay and which hayek talked about in a very big way for the uh, great depression and so on okay is i think is very difficult to implement in practice extremely difficult to implement in practice okay because this involves a shift of labor okay from the industries which you are going to allow to collapse okay you see i mean you you will get certain seeds of opinion even today okay uh, the in the united states and so on which are heavily drawing on hayek and so on when uh, you know they make this point that don't bail out these industries don't bail out these industries okay you know let them collapse let them collapse they have been inefficient they have been but the problem really is okay that schumpeter's 
or the hiking process. Fibita also talked about creative destruction, as you know, in the 1912 book. Okay, the process of creative destruction, process of creative destruction, is full of social cause, full of social cause. Okay, right, and um, I think would be very very difficult to implement in a country like India. That's one thing. Secondly, even as a logical thing, even as a logical thing, okay, when would creative destruction be justified? Creative destruction would be justified when the change in the demand for commodities. You see, there has been a structural change in the demand for commodities, okay, or there has been a structural technological change which has really rendered these industries. Obsolete from the economic point of view, okay. But where the causes, okay, where the causes are not really, you see, I don't think. I mean, with all due respect to the higher end position, that I don't believe that the causes of the U.S. cycle are real, okay. You see the real business cycle school, the real business cycle school, okay, which is a sort of progress of the new classical school, okay, is entirely displaced in their emphasis on the real factors in the business cycle. At least so far as the current global crisis, which is clearly and unequivocally a financial crisis, okay. Then in that case, okay, then in that case. Why impose the cost of adjustment on manufacturing units which have had nothing to do with the crisis? Okay, in the Hayekian system, in the Hayekian Austrian school, these were the industries which were creating structural bottlenecks. Okay, these were the industries for which demand was falling, or these were the industries in which technology was lagging. That's why they needed to be phased out, and that's why they are rightly destroyed in the process of creation. But this. Is I think an inappropriate medicine in the current U.S. context. In the current U.S. context, where the cause of the disease is definitely financial exuberance, comes from the financial side. Okay, so I may say, I will go with you to this extent. Okay, do not bail out, do not bail out Lehman, do not bail out Morgan. Okay, do not bail out AIG. Right. That position I accept because you know they have been the culprits in this. Okay, but I won't accept the position that units which are failing in the manufacturing sector through really no fault of theirs. Okay, but because their loans have turned bad, simply because they have invested in the securities. Okay, in this company. Okay, uh, before I give the floor to you again, I'll just add one more thing. The disturbing thing, even in the Indian context today. Is that corporates are increasingly going in for paper investments? Okay, today you will be surprised. Lots I I don't have the actual figures with me. Lots of corporates, lots of corporates have a treasury unit, have a treasury unit. Okay, which invest not only in government treasuries, which would have been understandable. There is we have fixed income derivatives, derivatives, equities, and so on. There is no law which prohibits them. Okay, they are suffering losses. They are suffering losses because they hold that paper. Okay, so therefore I don't think it's really a real side problem in that sense, and there is no reason to penalize the real side. Okay, yeah. So, if we are heading for a cashless society globally, and we are looking at it as a financial sector problem, can we kind of conclude that at some point there would have to be currency wars, currency resets, whether in the U.S. economy, the dollar, or and or other currencies, whose economies are highly over leveraged? I mean, I'm more on those. I'm not on India at all. I'm looking at it very global uh, landscape. Uh -huh. So, I would say that if we are not resetting the manufacturing industry, which I completely agree with you. Then the only other conclusion that I personally can draw is that there would have to be currency resets somewhere. Currency wars have will have to emanate. And any views on that, please? Thank you. Uh, you see, I think um, 
currency wars in a way are already occurring okay already currency wars are occurring okay and with the chinese currency playing a very big role you see and this this threat is definitely there this threat is there definitely there but this threat is not serious for this reason okay you see it was serious in the 1920s and 30s with the gold standard and you know the things now you see it is not serious for the simple reason that you have a mechanism okay a global mechanism to clear this in the sense of the imf uh, you know what is called that uh, you know i forget the exact provision i had it on the slides yesterday okay but we didn't talk about the imf okay uh, you see what it's called uh, essentially is the exchange rate monitoring mechanism okay on which people like ishwar prasad and others have done a lot of work okay? so this kinds of uh, watch dogs these kinds of watch dogs can take care of any imminent currency wars okay currency wars may occur for short periods but they are not going to be a structural part of the global economy because of the imf reforms because greater vigilance on the part of the imf greater vigilance on the part of the g20 okay greater vigilance because many of these countries between whom currency wars are likely to occur are part of the g20 so they will hopefully okay abide by g20 consensus you say g20 is emerging as a powerful force okay at the moment in an advisory capacity but i think this threat okay this threat was much more dominant in the world of 1930s see what happened if you talk about the smithsonian agreement in one way it was a currency war one way it was a currency war because many of the european currencies especially the french under de gaulle were refusing to countenance the rise of what they saw the rise of the dollar okay right so i think to, to that extent uh, you know i uh, would be more comfortable okay somebody at the back wanted a question right yeah yes. yeah one more question. this is the last question we'll take hello uh, my question is related to related to monetary policy as far as autonomy is concerned because our central government can borrow as much as money they wish from rbi so it leads to high powered money increase in high powered money uh, so called deficit financing and it will lead to increase in money supply why multiply process so in federal reserve reserve it is totally independent body to government so they have some restrictions in our country it's, i mean somehow dependent to government so what extent government should have intervention intervention in uh, this monetary policy about again the monetary policy and intervention uh, federal reserve yeah yeah you see i think uh, the scope for what used to be called deficit financing earlier okay has been uh, considerably controlled now okay there was a historic agreement signed between the reserve bank of india and the government of india which is i think september 1997 if i am not wrong september 1997 the historic agreement on the phasing out of what are called as the ad hoc treasury bills okay you see and they have been replaced by what are called the ways and means advances so technically technically today the reserve bank of india has got the power okay to tell either the central government or any of the state government that look here we can't offer you any more accommodation okay of course in reality this power is exercised with a great deal of discrimination a great deal of discussion okay so it does not really operate that way does not really operate that way but technically technically the balance of power has certainly shifted in terms of the central bank all over the world and this reflects some kind of global consensus okay um so therefore now monetization you see the def deficits are not automatically monetized okay people are much more aware today okay and government's hands are considerably tied in the process of running deficits borrowing programs are subject now to market discipline because you will notice that if the government puts out too many government securities you see the yields start rising so all these factors are there okay nevertheless i think uh, fiscal dominance will always remain a part of life okay fiscal dominance will always remain a part of any government's life okay suppose tomorrow war is declared okay 
physical dominance has been existing from the time of you would be surprised apart from the old emperors and so on okay even william pitt okay william pitt that is 1774 or something like that when even in embark on a war with france okay the monopoly okay of the then bank of england was completely broken okay much to the chagrin of the you know william pitt started borrowing very very heavily okay violating all norms so this has been going on for a long time and in an emergency it will happen it will always happen but you know now there are things like fiscal consolidation uh, what is that fiscal or uh, bill you know that fr ar frbm and so on okay response. yeah fiscal responsibility and so on both on the state governments and the so what for fiscal profligacy is definitely on the decline you see fiscal profligacy definitely on the decline to that extent central bank independence is slowly becoming if not real you know at least quasi real because i okay. yeah the central bank that never be, has is not independent in the sense that the governor still continues to be appointed by the government okay the deputy governors are appointed on the recommendation of the governor but subject to the finance ministry's approval and the prime minister's implicit approval okay and so also all those controls are there rbi uh, government nominees will be there on rbi board okay so therefore that kind of control is in a way inevitable in any kind of democratic arrangement so central bank cannot be 100% autonomous but what is necessary is that the day to day operations of the central bank okay should not be affected now for example it it has happened in the past that the reserve bank of india has raised the repo rate simultaneously the finance minister has made statements that banks should not raise their rates and this uh, creates a seizures crisis for the bank chairman because the cost of their funds have risen and they are being morally persuaded not to raise the cost of their uh, uh, you know loans all these problems are there okay but i think by and large the situation is not as bad as it was in the 60s and 70s okay right so that kind of dominance of government a uh, fiscal policy is not uh, is is not uh, i i would refer you to an excellent paper written by avinash dikshit and one of his uh, italian students okay which i saw as a working paper okay but now must have been i think now is published in some journal okay uh, which talks about fiscal dominance it talks about fiscal dominance and how it can arise even with central bank autonomy in the conventional sense okay so you know you can just give a google search and download that paper but uh, I, but i forget the name of the italian uh, the student with whom he has published that paper okay but it's it is certainly available as an i think an ndr working paper or was it uh, 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 university of princeton working paper something i've seen that thing okay thank you so i think we'll stop here uh, Uh, before we stop, uh, we would like to uh, felicitate sir because in uh, hurry yesterday we could not felicitate him. So formally, we we'll just felicitate him now by giving um, a token of love. has not only been my professor but we've decided that we are going to help take his guidance in mm -hmm. symbiosis school of economics to move ahead the journey and the path that we have set out for in fact um, he had come in january in in uh, june and actually gone through our syllabus and helped us say what was right what was wrong and symbiosis school of economics unlike gokhale which is established for a very long time we are in our fledgling stage for the msc uh it's only mentors like him and my dear friend and colleague dr rajesh parchure with whose inputs do we able to uh, you know hand hold and move ahead uh it's a great feeling because we collaborate while 
you know, uh, the students from the BSc of Symbiosis School of Economics have taken admission into the masters at Gokhale. And while the masters over here will have some of the Gokhale faculty coming to teach us, and other faculty would be interacting and using the library out here. I think we talk about, you know, collaborating with the world, but let's begin with two institutes which are very close by. I thank my colleague over here so much and the authorities at Gokhale Institute for sharing this. And you know, what I liked was the moment sir came in, obviously you want to conserve energy. He says, why can't we have a Gokhale and SSE, you know, lecture series? And uh, that's what really gave, gave rise to this because you come to the same city and I don't think we expect anybody to repeat these lectures for six, seven hours to two sets of students who are just not even a kilometer away. Uh, in case there have been some shortcomings in our arrangements, my, our apologies sincerely to all of you. And let's hope we take this forward in the future. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I, you know, I will just speak for two minutes. Uh, uh, you see, initially the idea was to give slightly more specialized lectures, okay, and um, so I think the original announced lectures were something different, okay. Uh, I was going to give a lecture on causality, but in a totally different spirit and at a much higher level. And then also a lecture on chaos theory, because these are the topics of my research interest, okay, and what have been working. Okay, uh, but now I am glad that I had a change of heart, okay, <laughs> right? Yeah, and uh, talked about the more uh, in the nature of reflections, more in the nature of reflections, okay? You see, what happens is when one reaches a certain stage of, um, uh, you know, so a certain age, I should say, okay, certain age, uh, you really like to talk about things on which you have worked directly or on which uh, you know, you have sort of, you, or at least you believe that you have made a little bit of contribution, okay? Uh, but uh, very often, okay, uh, you see, it is like this, okay, people always, in the tragedy of everyone, the people always respect you, okay, for the achievements that you don't regard as important, okay? You see, uh, uh, I mean, um, the philosopher Rousseau, okay, all of us know him for social contract. All of us know that he wrote the social contract thing. Actually, and this I'm sure none of you know, okay, I can be sure that nobody knows, Rousseau actually had made fundamental contributions in the sense of developing a new set of musical notations. Okay, new set of musical notations and throughout his life he believed that that was the major contribution that he had made. Okay, he wrote the social contract, that monograph, social contract was written by sitting for three continuous days and was written in order to get a prize. It was submitted as a prize winning essay. Okay, he never attached much importance to it. But he was elected as a member of the uh, French Academy of uh, what they call as Arts and uh, Sciences or something like that, of Liberal Arts, not because he had made that, he had actually submitted his notes for music, okay, as his sort of uh, uh, candidature for getting the, the thing. But he was actually given, okay, <laughs> it for the social contract. And it was his, to the dying, to his dying day, he said that, look here, nobody recognized my contribution to the water. <laughs> Similarly, you see, I um, always feel that whatever little I've done has been mainly in the area of econometric theory and the unraveling of econometric distinctions and so on. Okay, uh, these kinds of other things, okay, I do mainly as a matter of interest and because, you know, people expect a senior academic to have views on everything, okay? Uh, so, <laughs> but it happens that somehow more and more people know about this kind of work of mine rather than the work, uh, you know, that I, anyway, this is, this is just, uh, I am not intending to compare myself with Rousseau in any sense of the term, okay? Uh, you see, it's just that, you know, 
this is what uh, what happened. Sure, we'll we'll hear some one day for his specialty. No, 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 that's, yeah, 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 that's in, in in yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, right. Just uh, you know. Uh, uh, we we'll just ask Vishal to just give a formal note of thanks from Anwar Gokhale. So, thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics and uh, Symbiosis School of Economics, I would like to thank uh, uh, Nasne sir for giving a brainstorming three days session. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, these sessions help you a lot. And definitely, it changed our uh, thinking and views because sir has given just today's lectures was uh, a brainstorming. Means it changed our views to see the economics, and definitely, uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, have sir here. And we are looking forward to have uh, many sessions uh, in the uh, coming years. Thank you, sir, and thank you, students. <laughs>